go to the cloud. Okay. It looks like we are recording now. Yep. All right. So let's get started. So hi, everyone. It is March 4th, 2022. This is Jenkins Google Summer of Code office hours. So on the agenda, we will cover questions from potential GSOC contributors. We'll quickly um, highlight uh, some due dates that's coming up soon. And then lastly, we'll discuss application proposals. Are there anything else that we should add to the agenda? Okay. All right, so um, opening up to Q&A. So the first questions we have, and Vihan, since you are on the line, we would love for you to unmute and ask your questions. Yes, hello everyone. Hi. I just had a couple of questions. Uh, the first one being, I just wanted to understand the architecture that was behind the pipeline instead documentation generator, like how, how it works in order to fetch the documentation and what exactly does it go through in order to generate that documentation? Uh, if you could just give a brief overview of the architecture. Thank you. You, you are so lucky. That is an excellent question. And Kristen Whetstone, as original author, Kristen, go ahead. Sure, hi, um, glad you're interested in this type of this topic. So how this works, is it essentially like the pipeline stuff documentation generator is essentially a Jenkins plugin manager that runs without being run within Jenkins. So what it does is it, it's kind of, it starts up almost exactly like how Jenkins starts up. Um, when Jenkins starts, it, starts the plugin manager and it looks in a folder for different HPI or JPI files. And then it basically unzips them, parses and pulls them into its like own internal structure for being able to hold, handle plugins. And that's exactly what the plugin step documentation generator does too. It basically goes to the update center, pulls down every single plugin that's already zipped up and then extracts all of them into itself. And then now, since we have a plugin manager, we can now query that plugin manager for a bunch of different types of like information. And the one that we're looking for specifically here is anything that's annotated with a pipeline, like as a pipeline step. So then based on that, we can query it and then after we get our sub list of basically the classes that are the steps, then we kind of run through a kind of sort of interesting process of parsing all that information into an ASCII doc format. So then after you look at the, if you ever look at the pipeline step class, you can see that it has like certain fields for documentation or um, descriptions or inputs, and then it will be, convert that into an ASCII doc. But yeah, it essentially runs as like a a pipeline, or sorry, a plugin manager without a Jenkins. So, does that help, or do you have any other questions about how that's working? Yeah, I understood that part. And I just had one more doubt as how does it eliminate redundant documentation which you fetch? So, for example, uh, you could have the same documentation within two uh, plugins, right? So, the two, the, the same two plugins might have the same pipeline documentation. Is it correct? No, because um, it's unique classes. So it will like, I think you're trying to say like a plugin can't, or there's two plugins that have the same step defined. Yeah, that is what okay. I'm asking. Okay, so fundamentally they'll be different because it, unless there's like some really, I've never seen this happen in the Jenkins before, but you know, it can only load, it, the class of it, like it will load a class, right? So like every single class is unique and that's how it will end up getting the information for each of the different plugins. And then for, it will process each plugin separately. So then it will take like all the, like, so if you have, I guess the folders plugin or it's running something, it will generate all the documentation for the folders plugin and put it in its own sub ASCII doc into the folder. So I, I've never seen an instance, I don't know if there's any more experience here, of two identical classes inside of Jenkins, like some the two plugins that have ended up creating the exact same class definition. Um, but you don't we don't have to really worry about that because the plugin manager, if that is, that's like a fundamental Jenkins thing that's going to be beyond this, um, like because we're just using whatever Jenkins is using. Um, but no, I, I haven't seen an instance where there were two physically the same classes being loaded in to the plugin. So, 
it would have to be like exactly the same. And I've never seen that. Oh, okay, understood. Cool. Thank you. Yes, yeah, no problem. I have one follow up on the one follow up question on this. Sure. Uh, so you, you you talked about uh, a mock Jenkins that comes up uh, in this whole process, right? Yeah. So I was wondering, like, can we have another uh, similar Jenkins mock setup with UI available as well for I, I, I don't know for uh, taking some screenshots? So is that possible to generate a mock UI with a UI mock I'm Jenkins not- with a UI? Sorry. That's a good question. I'm not sure because what we what the basically the mock Jenkins is um, it's just querying a whole bunch of pieces of information that are usually about like where it's running and like a certain has it loaded a certain step yet. And uh, since Jenkins isn't actually running, it can't verify. You know, it's like no, clearly this step hasn't run yet because there's no Jenkins. Um, I'm not sure that it will be able to pop up a the whole UI because it's pretty much just replacing calls that the plugin manager makes to like its own Jenkins. Um, I'm sure maybe there'll be a way to kind of do that, but I'm I think it would require a lot of I, I wonder ex- if- expiration out like else it I, unfortunately I can't solve it with this tool, but maybe there is another sort of exploration that can be done with this type of mock. Yeah, yeah I might offer a different tool, Diraj that in the in the Jenkins test harness, so there's a the 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 framework that Jenkins plugins use to perform their tests, there is a, a test class called Jenkins rule that approximates a Jenkins controller. And it approximates it with some some sort of imperfect approximation for speed reasons. Recently, as in the last like six or nine, maybe 12 months, there's been a new thing added called the real Jenkins rule, which actually forks a Jenkins war file, if I understand correctly, and runs the tests inside a real Jenkins. No, no fakes, yeah. no, no anything. It's real. And, and that might be something that for your case where you're saying, I need the real thing. Right, because you you truly want yes. the absolutely right. real thing to be running, right. and so you might consider using real Jenkins rule as one. Now, now the other is because Jenkins is ultimately multi-threaded and able to handle multiple concurrent requests. It would also be okay just to start a Jenkins dot war file and connect to it from multiple concurrent processes and then stop the Jenkins war later. I, I don't know that you have to use one of these test frameworks because your, your, the, the, the project idea you're working from, I think is the one where could we do automatic generation of documentation screenshots? And in order to do that, yes. what, you, what you need is you need the thing to present a real Jenkins user interface, but Jenkins can present user interface to multiple people concurrently. And so in your scenario, you, you might be able to just run one Jenkins war and then run many threads that each thread opens a, a, a fake browser and captures the image from the, from the browser. Yeah, that would probably work better than what was happening here. Because again, yeah, it, it's it, the kind of how we're faking out Jenkins is very much a where are you in the startup process type deal? And there's nothing there. So we're trying to just kind of be like, oh yes, we're at the point where we can start setting up plugins. And so the plugin manager can run. <laughs> that's what we're using. That, that's kind of how the uh, this part works. So I like the idea of using the Jenkins real rule too. That's nice. Well, and, and the pipeline step doc generator really doesn't need to execute pipelines. Exactly. Right? It, it doesn't doing... need to present a UI. That's nope. not its role. And so exactly. it, it's good that it's as lightweight as it is. Yes. Because it's, it is, in fact, loading hundreds of plugins while it's doing its work. Right. And this is also another kind of maybe a caveat. Um, I would not attempt to load every single plugin. <laughs> like uh, we have it running on in the CI system for Jenkins itself, because it requires a lot of 
um, I've run into issues where like it runs into open file, you know, run out of open file handles um, because it's just, there's just so much. There's so many plugins, which is great for Jenkins, but not so great for your own computer. So um, I would try to take like a smaller snapshot. Like if you have maybe stand up your own local Jenkins, you can use that, the plugins, the default plugins that are come with Jenkins um, or any other combination of things you want to test. But yeah, I would not attempt to do to actually try to generate the documentation for everything because it it's not it's not fun to try to because <laughs> they'd have to figure like um to run out of open file handles on your computer. So yes. So this is very helpful. Thanks, uh Kristen and Mark. I'll go through the real Jenkins rule and Jenkins rule and uh, test hardness mm -hmm. and try to make sense of it. Excellent. Now, back to Vihan. Vihan, you had asked questions number one and two. I think we addressed one. I think there is still something on two. Do you want to give us some more details there, or just to, should we just take the phrasing as is? Yeah, I think there's not much to it, but just the phrasing as it is. Okay, so, so your question is, will there be separate channels for every project? There have been in the past. And if that's that's a preference, or if the GSOC channel were to become too noisy for us, we certainly can create separate channels. Uh, in the past, for instance, I think there was a separate channel for the, the Git plugin that we used just for topics about Git. And we've certainly got the docs channel that could be used for the pipeline step doc generator. That, that would be an easy place to have that conversation. I believe, Chris, that there are Gitter channels specific to Jenkins File Runner, aren't there? I, I don't remember for sure, but I, th I thought there were. Yeah, that's one. Okay, so so I guess the answer is yes, we can use separate channels if that will help. Did that, Vihan, does that address your question or is that too too nebulous and we need to be more precise? Well, I think, it addresses my question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions for our mentors? Okay. So we can move on. And then if you have questions, feel free to. Oh, just a oh, minute. Yeah. Alyssa, it looks like mm -hmm. Rishikesh just had I'm a sorry. question. Sometimes oh. I get stuck on solving an issue. I get confused by different mentor opinions, and I'm not sure what is the right way of solving the issue. Great so question. That, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And, and you'll see that kind of thing where what it hints is the mentors actually don't always know the right answer. At least I know I don't. I am absolutely confident I do not always know the right answer. And so... Yeah, don't be don't be shy at saying, hey, this didn't work for me. If a mentor says something, they're just they're giving their best best estimate and probably haven't done the detailed research themselves to prove that their suggestion is the right thing to do. That, that's I, that's probably a terrible thing to say, Rishikesh, but I'm, I'm not. Many times I'm just making a good guess when I make my answers. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, no further questions. Okay, I'm moving on. So some upcoming due dates. Um, I just want to highlight again, you know, check out the timeline, see what's upcoming and, that are due. So I put here some two items that are pretty much what we're in the process at the moment. So March 7th to April 3rd, Potential GSOC contributors discuss application ideas with mentoring organizations. Um, we, we are seeing a lot of activity and discussions in Gitter, which is excellent. We want to see that. And then, of course, April 4th is when your application period begins. So that takes me into the next item that we want to talk about is the application um, proposal. So this link here, it's really, it, it spells out all you need to do for, um, to fill out your application, right? So the 
two things that we want to uh, emphasize is project proposal template. And Mark will go through a, um, a quick demo on how to use this. Um, but this is here for you to use as guidance. And the other thing we wanted to stress is that um, you need to be submitting your proposal for, for the community to review um, as soon as possible. Because um, you know, with more people looking at your proposal, it's likely that they will help to strengthen your proposal and then so that you can meet the, the Google's deadline. Um, I have put here a couple samples for you to, to review. There's three samples that I have put here. And basically, um, oh, this is not the right link. No, I click on the wrong thing. Here we go. So this was last year's proposal, basically short email, right? And, but we will be using um, discourse instead of um, Google Mail here. Um, basically, let us know what your proposal looks like. Share this with us and then you will get um, the community mentors to uh, provide feedback and such. But there's three examples for you to, um, to use, okay? Um, so Mark, I will hand it over to you for the demo. Great, thanks. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. And if we're lucky, you'll see now my screen with a great big terminal window. Can you confirm that? Yes. Okay, so we'll put that away, put that away, put that away, lots of putting away. Okay. So to the Jenkins homepage and make it big enough to see sub projects, Google Summer of Code in Jenkins. Let's see, and here it was, you were, had guided us information and application guidelines for contributors. Yep, Check three. out the ideas and open the project template. So here it is. Okay, so I'm now inside this project template and I want to do a file, make a copy. And I'm gonna give it a name that works for me. So GSOC 2022, last name, wait, proposal name. I'm gonna do mine for the Git Cash maintenance proposal because that's one that I've been uh, active on. I, I could do it for any one of them, but let's take that one. Okay. So now I have an editable file. In order to allow others to comment on it, I'm going to choose share in the top right corner there, change to anyone with the link, and I'm going to grant them commenter permission. So now when I copy this link and paste it, actually, I'll just paste it here in the chat so the rest of you could open this and make comments on it. You could make suggestions and help me improve it. And then I'll start, start editing here. So into the chat, where is our friendly local chat app? Chat. So you're all welcome to open this Google Doc that I've paste, pasted its link there. And I'm going to put it as Git Cache Maintenance. And I'm gonna delete the template line and just start filling in information. Yes, this is me. And yes, I'm at mark.earl.wait at gmail.com. And I'll start working on this. Now, what this means is Kristen and Chris and Alyssa and Anyone can come in here and change and help and guide. So my abstract, they may say, hey, your abstract's really weak and suggest a change like automate, automatic git cache maintenance for Jenkins controllers and agents. And 
Now I've got the opportunity. Oh, and look at this. Notice in the top right hand corner, I see four different people who have opened this and are, are ready to help me. So it's that simple. And somebody is highlighting project abstract. Well done. So to make this page a little more easy to read, let's go full size. So this was that they were suggesting, and I could go copy the, the text from the original project idea and paste it in here. That's a great place to start. Don't be shy about using other people's content, other people's information to help your proposal be better. So if I do what I just said, I would look at sub projects, Google Summer of Code, project ideas, automatic Git cache maintenance on the controller, and might copy this background as the initial project description. It's a good start. So that's, that's the beginning. And, and this is where it starts. And then I would paste this URL. So click the share button, copy the link, and I would go to community.jenkins.io. And I'm going to do, let's see, new topic. And it would be Git Cache Maintenance Project Idea. I think we want these in GSOC, right, Alyssa? Yes, we do. OK, so that's probably then Community GSOC. And now one of the things would love to have feedback. On this project proposal for GSOC. I and would one also of, suggest oh, adding proposal to the, um, the subject line. Oh, oh yes, right. Well, and, right, right. So something like this. And because it's no longer a project idea, it's really a proposal. Mm -hmm. Do it like that. Now, one of the things I like about, um, about what do you call it? About community.jenkins.io is when I put the hyperlink on a separate line, I get this nice big block. It makes it very obvious to people they should click that thing. It's even more visible than a, than a hyperlink. So. For me, I find it very attractive to just put the whole thing on a single link on one line. That's the whole thing. And it gives me this nice big block on the right with the title in, in it, et cetera. Any questions on that process? Now, I'm not going to create this topic because it, I'm not actually looking. I'm not ready to take requests yet for this document. All right, so we've got we've got a record of how you submit what you do to create it and and it would then be visible to others and they could then go in and make their comments on it. Oh, and there, Chris, thank you. This is a comment. Very good. I, I, in all seriousness, that is how it works. Just like what Alyssa showed earlier of the the document that was from a previous year that was filled with many different comments, the way the ideas came to be better and better was by candidates proposing their document and then mentors and other candidates commenting on it, trying to get better understanding, trying to comprehend what, what it should be, how should it be expressed. Now, another safety check here is be sure after you've been through a few reviews, be sure you look at the official Google definitions to be absolutely sure that every detail that they've requested is covered. They, they, are, they are, and the mentors are quite serious that we need to be able to read effectively and follow directions. That's, that's I think, what I had. Alyssa, any, anything else that you wanted me to highlight? Anything else that we should show in this demo? 
No, I think we've covered everything. We have the, you know, where you can find information. We got the due dates. We've got some samples. We've got templates. I think we've covered it. But we do have a question from Diraj. Um, do companies allow their employees to participate in programs like GSOC? And, and I think the answer is yes, yeah. so long as you're allowed, so long as your company allows you to, so long as your company allows you to contribute to open source, some do not. There are some companies, uh, commonly financial institution, banks, that may forbid you from contributing to open source but most companies will allow open source contributions on personal time. Uh, the, the time commitment for Google Summer of Code of roughly 20 hours a week is quite heavy if you're already working full time. So, so that may be something that you have to, to weigh in your mind. Do I really want to apply for this? Because the expectation is you'll put in 15 to 20 hours a week for 12 weeks. And if you're already working a full-time job, 15 or 20 hours a week is an awful lot of extra time. Diraj, does that address your question? Yes, certainly. And makes total sense as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so, so the, the licensing or the, the question, am I, allowed to, am I allowed to contribute to open source for my current employer is a valid question. It's one that each employer is different. I've, I've worked for some employers where, where there was, it was quite involved to get permission to contribute to open source and others where it was, it was trivial and they just said, yes, contribute to open source. Please don't do damage to our business when you do it. Nice. Good to know. All right. <laughs> so I wanted to pause here. Chris, in your experience, as you were applying to Google Summer of Code, because you've done two Google Summer of Code projects. Were there any points of guidance you wanted to offer to people as we are closing the last few minutes here of, of our office hours? Um, maybe like one point I really wanted to bring, like bring up is to like take initiative. Uh, don't rely too much on your mentors to tell you what to do. Because like sometimes you may have like multiple mentors. I like that. that that's it. That, that, that sort of reinforces the notion that the mentors, the mentors aren't, are certainly not all-knowing. We're, we're learning and growing and developing. And so taking initiative and proposing an idea um, is great. And if the idea is flawed, it'll be discussed. Don't be shy. Try a different idea then. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, Alyssa, I think that's it. Thanks very right. much. Thank you, everybody. I will post the recording um, in a few hours. Hang on. Vion seems to have a raised hand. Oh. On Vion. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I missed it in the beginning, but I just had one more question regarding the Python step combinator. Was just about how I'm approaching the project. So currently what I'm doing is I'm studying the pipeline documentation as well as the user feedback that is attached with the project link. So analyzing that, I'm actually identifying and noting on the flaws, but not the flaws, but probably the things that could be improved with the way we generate the documentation. Yeah. And currently I wasn't able to actually follow up much with the issues that were listed on the project page. Um, so what should I do? Should I be able to follow up with them and get to know how stuff works? Or should I just stick to uh, my own part and just uh, identify the best way to produce a documentation? Thank you. So I think the ultimate goal is find the best way to produce the documentation, but I'm, I'm not sure on the, you say you weren't able to follow the issues. Is that because the the feedback was incomplete in the in that the feedback, or was there something else? I, I may have misunderstood there, Vihan. Yeah, the issues I'm talking about are the issues listed on the GR GitHub issues, like those issues. So ah. which were linked along with the project page idea. Okay, and okay. and there it's that they are incomplete. They are insufficiently described to to understand how to duplicate them or something different um, for me i couldn't find them relevant enough for this project idea 
Ah, I'm not sure okay. If that is oh, okay. Probably, okay. Yeah. Right, right. And so many of them, many of them may not be related to the product project idea at all. Correct. I see what you're right. saying. Yeah, you you opened the Jenkins.io issue list, and you see 140 issues, and they are certainly not all, or even the majority of them, about pipeline steps. And therefore, that's perplexing. You were you were thinking, hey, these these would be closer to the project I'm working on than they actually are. I I, I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah, so those that is all the issues for that site, not just the pipeline steps documentation issues. Oh, I see. Okay. So like before working on an issue or starting to work on an issue, should I just put it on the Gitter chat that um, I'm trying to work on this issue and should I go ahead with that? You can oh, do sure. that. Although there's there's actually no risk to just starting on an issue and, and saying, hey, I'm working on this issue. Put a comment into the issue itself. I'm working on this issue. And that's enough. You don't have to, you don't even have to say it in Gitter. Just on the issue itself, say I'm starting work on this issue as a comment. Okay. Usually, within within twelve or twenty four hours, one of us will probably assign it to you. Then, just to be absolutely clear, but no problem if you just make a comment in the issue and say I'm working on this. That's already good enough. You don't have to wait for anybody to say yes, you can work on it. You don't have to. That we do not have the problem of too many people working on issues. Right. <laughs> that is, that is I, I don't remember the last time we had that problem in an open source project. So it's almost always we don't have enough people working on it, not that we have too many. Thanks a lot and sorry for the time delay. Oh no, no that's all good. That, that's a great question. Thank yes. you very much for taking the time to ask it. Thanks a bunch. Yeah. All right, if you have additional questions, just pop it in Gitter and we'll um, get it answered. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.